So does anybody want to talk about uh, the, the new physics theory of life, where they talk about basically the origin and subsequent evolution of life following from the fundamental laws of nature should be as unsurprising as rocks rolling downhill? And my understanding of what he's saying is basically that inorganic matter or matter itself, um, when it's in a situation where it's in a heat sink or when it's in a temperature sink and when it's receiving external energy, will configure itself such that it's most efficient at absorbing energy and dissipating it into its external environment. And that basically because there's that natural tendency of matter, um, that's why in the like primordial soup of the early earth, you get like base these atoms and molecules like reconfiguring themselves to become like these complex proteins and amino acids and DNA strands and eventually cells. I, I think it kind of makes sense. I think it would be, it would actually not make sense to think that, <laughs> Well, I mean, obviously life arises from the laws of the universe um, and it would make sense that it would be kind of a, a, a natural progression. The way that I think about life is just that, um, I know this isn't like the scientific definition of, of life, but in some sense, life is just like self-perpetuating systems or, or systems that replicate themselves in some way with like a little bit of alteration each time. And That's it, part it of makes- the scientific definition. It's part of the scientific definition, but not the whole thing, because there's other things that are self-replicating that aren't considered life. Um, But I I don't think it's that crazy or or surprising that self-perpetuating systems would self-perpetuate and that we would get more of them (laughs) and that and that uh, as entropy increases and like new things get introduced into the system, they would become more complex and and you know, spiral into what we think of as life now. Well, well, yeah. And importantly, like what life tends to do as it, uh, you know, what you always hear people say, you know, I want my kids to have it better than I had it, you know, like, like that's kind of, that's kind of, it seems like a central motif of life on earth. You know, like I want to, I want to reduce entropy in my environment so that my kids can have a more predictable and successful life. Because if they do that, then you will, you will self-perpetuate better. Like the, the systems yeah. that self-perpetuate most effectively will self-perpetuate. Are the ones that kind of clear their, clear their environment and make their environment kind of to their liking, basically. I thought it was interesting in terms of being a theory of like how life began on earth. Because like I always thought, I've always been like disturbed by the big gap there. Like it seems like we have like almost like a glut of theories explaining how when life exists, how it might change. But we we don't really have any good explanation for how life initially began. Like the, right. the, the current explanation is basically that um, like primary abiogenesis, which is like life emerged through maybe random chance or maybe some mechanism mechanism that we don't know because it was struck by lightning or, or something. Like that's basically the theory. Like I'm not exaggerating. And it seems like this is interesting because it provides like a possible, a possible mechanism through which that could happen, which always seemed like it was lacking. Yeah, and this goes back to, I guess this is like off topic, but this goes back to our, our discussion about AI and, and how uh, at the time I was saying, well, you know, to me, it kind of makes sense that if you have the earth and you have some water and you have some sunshine and you do this for a billion years, eventually, you know, you're going to get sort of these, these, stru- these structured systems which take in energy and dissipate energy. And eventually the structures will become, you know, some, you know, like you have, you have, just endless amounts of like water molecules and car- like carbon atoms and, and structures. And, and like you, you have so many chances with the sun just shining on the earth for, for millions and billions of years, eventually you're going to get something that can replicate itself. Yeah. And then once you have that, then you have life. Well, not necessarily but- like, like it, if there's not a mechanism to explain why that would happen, it, it still seems very unlikely, which is why this series is so interesting. Yeah, I, I think the, the the crucial point of the theory is that it's not just randomness. It's it's that statistically, no. like what the universe is likely to do is to take these. The crucial part of the theory is that a billion years is a is an incomprehensibly long amount of time. Basically, given a billion years, anything is possible. Right. Well, that's, that, that, that's, the, that's the crucial part of the mainstream theory. Mm-hmm. But we're talking about what this guy was saying, which was saying that there's like something inherent. In the nature of the universe as it relates to entropy where where energy wants to t- take these concentrated forms and then dissipate and that that's that naturally happens even to inanimate particles if you put them in a heat bath under these certain conditions so it's not 
I mean, of course, like anything's possible over billions of years, but it's not just random. It's also directed by entropy itself. That was the innovation in this particular theory that we're talking about. Or it's like universe wants to express itself in, in different forms or something like that, right? It almost like takes away the need for it to be like volitionality in the universe because it's basically just saying it's a property of matter that it organizes in this way. So it almost yeah. like, it almost does seem to like reduce like the like God in the gaps of that particular mm-hmm. hole in science. No, it sounds like it's introducing a God. <laughs> it sounded like the opposite. But he's, he's uh, something interesting. You guys know Conway's Game of Life? Yeah. Yeah. So Conway's Game of Life is like this. It's like a simple 2D grid. And it's like, if this block is surrounded by three blocks, then it's going to disappear. And if it's surrounded by four, then it's going to appear and bec- become a block. It's very simple rules. And I like to um, imagine like what rules or what conditions or what uh, time span would you need to have a simple game like this, uh, which is like a, it's like a 2D universe in order to create something by chance that was self-replicating. And you can actually make things that are self-replicating. Like people have sat down and put the dots in the boxes to make a, a factory machine, a, a factory that makes factories and all this kind of stuff. But it seems like it, it kind of blows my mind to think about how long or how much randomness or what you would need for it to actually create life. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's extremely unlikely that life Mm. would develop just on any random planet because we've observed many planets and none of them appear to have life. Um, That being said, uh, it's kind of hard to figure out whether certain exoplanets have life or whether there are other forms of life that just are so different from what we're familiar with that we don't recognize it when we see it. But clearly, you know, clearly the earth was a, a fertile ground for this to happen. Maybe it was, you know, exceedingly unlikely that life would develop on earth or maybe as this article kind of suggests maybe it was inevitable well if you believe in determinism then of course it was inevitable all along (laughs) but i don't believe in determinism (laughs) (laughs) just long time spans and probabilities and and things being in motion 